Hello, this is Martin Gore from Depeche Mode. Hi, this is Dave Garn from Depeche Mode, and you are listening to My Nerd World. It is My Nerd World, and welcome to it. I'm your host, John Justice. Could not stay away from the mic this week. As of the recording of this particular episode, we are uh, well four and a half, five days away from the official release of Memento Mori. Uh, I'm excited. I know that you're excited. I just can't wait to hear from you, to hear your thoughts on Memento Mori, and to start that conversation. I just feel like we're just on the precipice of... A lot of commentary, discussion, and honestly, joy over the release of this 15th album from Depeche Mode. So the plan is, I wasn't planning on doing um, a show until after the album came out. However, there's been quite a bit of news that's dropped over the course of the past few days. And um, I've also received a lot of emails. So I thought, you know what? Um, I'll do some shows leading up to a Friday this week. Uh, depending on when I have time. It's Monday, and I had some time, so I figured, you know what? Let's go ahead and pop on, and uh, we'll do a a special uh, bonus episode. So this week, there'll be a couple of bonus uh, episodes leading uh, leading into the the big show uh, coming up this weekend after the release of Memento Mori. And again, I just can't wait to hear from all of you after you have an opportunity to hear this amazing album. So, uh, let's not waste any time though. I got listener feedback that I want to get to. Um, no fan spotlight this, uh, this show. I will be doing one later in the week, but I do have, um, a couple of news items to share before we get to the comments from you since last week's episode. And first we're going to start off here. And I know this is going to be exciting news for many of you who uh, listen to this show and may be in Australia or Asia. It turns out that Dave Gaughan, in an interview, let it slip, and this news just dropped over the course of the past hour, uh, that Depeche Mode is heading to Asia and Australia through the spring of 2024 for the first time in 30 years. I remember reading some listener feedback from you living in Australia, talking about the fact that you haven't had the opportunity to see Depeche Mode in Australia for decades. And it looks like that will be changing uh, next year as, uh, again, Dave let it slip uh, that the band will be heading to Asia and Australia um, in the spring of 2024, again, the first time in 30 years, which kind of raises the question in my mind of whether or not we're going to see... um, even more dates on this tour. I mean, this year is obviously pretty packed, um, especially here across the United States, uh, but it wouldn't be unheard of for them to return for a few more shows next year uh, here in the U.S., and so we'll uh, we'll have to wait and see. Clearly, though, it appears that uh, Martin and Dave are uh, are getting along. I just watched the promo clip from the uh, Terratata a show that was uh, filmed several weeks ago that will be airing later this week. And you can just tell that Dave and Martin are really getting along um, in the absence of Fletch. And I'll get into some rather interesting details about the um, difficulties that the band had in the making of Spirit, which I talked about on the most recent show that have come to light during these uh, during these interviews. But it seems as if Martin and Dave are, um, well, maybe even happier than they've been in a long time, even with the passing of Fletch that has sort of forced these two individuals to perhaps develop a relationship that they haven't had in a long time or maybe have never had before. It just really, I, it really appears that way, based off of all the interviews that I've read and uh, and some of the promotion that we've seen. So, again, the big news, uh, Depeche Mode, uh, next year in 2024, heading to uh, Asia and Australia. All right, let's uh, move over to other tour news. They did play a secret show on uh, the 16th last Thursday at SIR in Los Angeles. This would be Studio Instrumental Instrument Rentals. I've never heard of this place before. It seems like an odd place to perform. However, this reminds me quite a bit of when 
they did the secret show. This was for K-Rock in Los Angeles, KROQ. Uh, it reminds me of when they did the uh, the the warm-up show on the Exciter Tour that took place at the Roxy that I've mentioned that I had a chance to go to. They played a much longer set for that show than they did for this show. This seems a little bit more in line with the uh, Ultra Launch Party shows, although they did do a, appears to be a longer set than what they did at those shows. So the set list goes as follows um, during the rehearsal at uh, SIR in Los Angeles for K-Rock Radio. Ghosts again, I feel you, a pain that I'm used to, world in my eyes, stripped, wrong, John the Revelator, and I guess I should probably reemphasize wrong, that surprised me, uh, and enjoy the silence. So before I add a little bit more commentary to that, when you add in the other tracks that they've performed live and also... Um, an obvious choice, at least one, we kind of get an idea, a further idea of what the set list is going to look like beyond whatever tracks they end up doing from Memento Mori. And I'll have um, further thoughts on that here in a, in a moment as well. Uh, but they've performed Precious Now, uh, Wagging Tongue, My Favorite Stranger, uh, Personal Jesus, and I think Never Let Me Down Again is a foregone conclusion. One, they seem to do that every single tour. And two, uh, given the um, resurgence in popularity because of the inclusion of Never Let Me Down Again on uh, The Last of Us, it seems to, to be a given that, uh, that that particular song will be played live. I would love to see them actually open with that. I mean, typically they play that as an encore. I think that would be pretty rad if they opened with that. But I think most of us are expecting they're going to open up with My Cosmos is Mine or a version of that. I saw somebody um, making an argument that perhaps they would open up with Wagging Tongue. Uh, the band typically opens up with two new tracks. Um, my expectation is, yeah, that that may be the case. It may be My Cosmos is Mine uh, rolling into uh, Wagging Tongue or My Favorite Stranger. So, um, you know, that's not quite half of what they normally play, about 18 to 20 songs, but it is a good chunk. But let's get back to the set list from SIR. Um Word of my eyes, not a huge surprise there. Stripped, you know, not one that they've avoided live, but certainly not one that they've done with consistency. I mean, I think the last time they did Stripped live goes back to, I want to say Sounds of the Universe, but if I'm, I think that was fly, Flies on the Windscreen. So I don't know, and I don't believe they did it last year. I would stop and go and pull up my live disc. I don't have it memorized. I know, bad Depeche Mode fan. I don't have it memorized. I don't believe they did Stripped on... The Spirit or Delta Machine Tour, but I could be wrong. And if I am, I'm sure you're going to correct me. So talkshownerd at gmail.com. Um, I am very surprised at the inclusion of wrong. From my own extrapolation, that seemed to be a track that Dave had a difficult time doing. In my opinion, I didn't particularly care for the way that he sang it on the Sounds of the Universe Tour. Now... I also didn't care overall for the way that Dave sang on the Barcelona live release. He sounded very nasally on a lot of those tracks. Um, and I just went and watched it again recently. And again, I was, I was struck, and I always am every time I watch that, that not the entirety of the performance, but the first half, at least, Dave is really nasally, especially the way that he sang um, wrong. So I was surprised to see the inclusion of that just because I didn't feel like it worked that great live. Now, perhaps they've reworked it a bit and you may feel differently. I just know that um, my take on it was that it didn't quite work live. John the Revelator, uh, excellent choice, surprising choice. Not necessarily given it's John the Revelator coupled with some Memento Mori songs fits really well. Uh, again, that's not to say there's anything on Memento Mori that sounds like John the Revelator, but um, it is to say that they would work well with the Memento Mori tracks. So that one is a very um, welcome uh, surprise to a return to the set list, and this is all assuming they'll do this on the tour. Um, and then a pain that I'm used to, and I'm assuming they did the remix version of that and not the album version. Um, they sort of have taken to that particular version in the same way that they did the Zephyr mix 
for um, in your room. So again, I was a little bit surprised. Um, worked uh, put together a set list. Uh, me and a friend of mine, sort of uh, our uh, our own guesses to what the set list would be, and uh, Wrong and John the Revelator did not make it on. And I don't think Strip did either. Uh, might have made it on my fantasy get on my fantasy playlist, but I have to go back and look. But wrong and Je- and uh, wrong and John the Revelator certainly did not uh, end up on my particular fantasy list. All right, um, now let's go ahead and uh, get to. I'm not going to read to uh, it to you in its entirety, but a rather uh, interesting article from the New York Times, the exquisite darkness of Depeche Mode. And one particular portion of it in particular I found uh, very much uh, of interest that I wanted to share with you. Towards the end of the uh, article, which um, goes through a rather lengthy history of the of the band, uh, but when we get to more of the more recent times, the article lands here. And it goes as follows. The recording sessions for the previous Depeche Mode album, Spirit, had been contentious. Ever since Clark's exit, there had been a clear division of labor in the band. Gore wrote virtually all the lyrics, and Gone sang the words. But in the early 2000s, Gone started making solo albums and began bringing his own songs into Depeche Mode sessions as well. As Gone sees it, He's always been the Depeche Mode member who's pushed the band outside its comfort zone. After Nirvana Nirvana broke out in the early 90s, it was Gone who showed up to record songs of faith and devotion with the hair down to his shoulders, advocating for a grittier sound. Without him, you might never have heard live drums or a gospel choir on a Depeche Mode track. All of those things were considered threats, Gone said. But when Gone pushed, it was traditionally Fletch who pushed back. He would always stand up for Martin, Gone said. And if there was a vote, I would lose. At the Spirit Sessions in 2016, those creative tensions reached what Gone called a boiling point. Martin wasn't really keen on some of Dave's songs, the Spirit producer producer Ford said, and Dave was pushing really hard for them to be on the record. It was very, very difficult. Ford said that he was told by Depeche's management that the project was in jeopardy. His solution was to banish everyone except Gone and Gore from the studio, including Fletcher, their traditional buffer. Fletch did not like this, Gone said. I think in the end, our manager, uh, excuse me, our manager, Jonathan, had to literally physically get him out. Ford said the following day um, resembled a marriage counseling session. Gone recalled the confrontation was really hard. After all those years, he said some stuff. I said some stuff. They cleared the air enough to finish Spirit, released in 2017. And Gone said any reservations he had about making the next album disappeared from the moment he heard Gore's demo for the song Ghosts again. I was like, I can't wait to sing this song. Then it was May, and suddenly Andy Fletcher was dead. I felt immediately very supportive of Martin, Gone said. Like, I've got to take care of him. This is really much harder on Martin than it is on me. They decided to go ahead with Memento Mori, and according to both Gore and Gone, Fletcher's passing fostered an intimacy that they'd never experienced in 40 years as bandmates. Every decision that has to be made has to be made by the two of us now, Gore said. So we kind of have to talk things out when we disagree. I don't think I've ever had a FaceTime with Dave before now, we FaceTime. Privately, Gon said Gore described their dynamic to him in more profound terms. At one point, I always say too much. I'll regret it later when I read this, he said to me. It's kind of like we're long-lost brothers, isn't it? Marta Salongni, an Italian producer and engineer who worked with Bjork, Frank Ocean, and XX, and the rare woman in this very male orbit, said it was wonderful to witness Gore and Gon's flourishing relationship, uh, excuse me, friendship, and the creativity it engendered. With Andy being a filter, after he passed, the filter unfortunately disappeared, and suddenly the curtain dropped, and they were there to face each other. She said, honestly, um, honesty comes down to the forefront, and you just face what you perhaps haven't faced before. The mood at the sessions, Ford said, was very somber, but there was also a lot of reminiscing. Fletcher um, Fletcher's stories told over long lunches. It was honestly a very, 
A really lovely, beautiful experience, he said. Uh, Depeche Mode, Gon suggested, has always survived by evolving. Sometimes we've changed naturally, and sometimes change has been forced upon us, he said. And I think that's what's happening now. We've lost any integral part of Depeche Mode who's irreplaceable. We've lost an integral part of Depeche Mode, excuse me, who's irreplaceable. Circumstances forced us to be different, to think of each other in a different way. We need each other in a different way. Before I comment on this, I'm going to move. I, I have some I have some thoughts here. Um, but with that, I'm going to immediately move ahead to um, the listener feedback portion of the show. Uh, and Because the first one that I want to share with you uh, is, in my mind, in direct relation to how I want to respond to what I just read here from the New York Times article. So let's go ahead and get to uh, listener feedback. As always, you can leave a comment on YouTube. Be sure to like and subscribe. Um, or you can email me, talkshownerd at gmail.com. So we'll start off here. Uh, Safit Skurik, and if I said that in, in, uh, incorrectly, I apologize, um, asked this. The biggest question, I know it's probably not possible, but which previous album would you compare Memento Mori to the most in terms of sound and melodies? And so if you just happen to be listening to this episode for the very first time, um, I've had a copy of the album now for, um, I guess, about a month or so. Um, and if you've missed my full review, go back and listen to about three uh, episodes um, ago. So speaking to the change in the relationship between Martin and and Dave, and to the question here of what album would you compare it to the most in terms of sound and melodies, you know, the Safet asks, I know it's not possible. It's kind of not. Memento Mori is wholly Depeche Mode. But at the same time, and I mentioned this in my review, it is something in and of itself different. I suppose if I had to, if you forced me to, I would say ultra in terms of sound and melodies, but even then it doesn't really fit into that either. Um, it It's a celebration, and again, this is these are things that I've said before. It really is, in my opinion, a celebration of the band's career. This article and knowing now the relationship that... Martin and Dave had and how it would appear that the work environment has changed to me sheds quite a bit of light on why Memento Mori sounds like it does and why in my opinion this is the best in totality team that the band has had and I'm going to go ahead and include Martin and Dave working together to create this now whereas it would sound as if things were very much fragmented among the band, among the band between writing and producing um, the musical aspect. They kind of come together and land on a sound that they all agree upon. But it sounds like with Martin and Dave working together more than ever, we are experiencing for the full st- for the first time a a de- a working Depeche Mode in a fashion that we've never had before, and it shows in the results of this um, album. So that makes a lot of sense to me as to why Memento Mori sounds the way it does. Holy Depeche Mode, while at the same time being something very, very different. Um, You know, listening to a bit of Spirit the other day, again, there really isn't anything on Spirit that I can compare it to. The only songs on Memento Mori that I even venture to go and compare to previous tracks would be Soul With Me by Martin. Um... A friend of mine, John J O H N Justice, said he likened it to Jezebel, and I can certainly see see that. I mean, it definitely sounds like a Martin song, and it's in that vein. Although I personally believe that it's far and away the best Martin track that he's sang on since Home. Again, in my opinion, um, it's it's an absolutely gorgeous, uplifting song about death. Uh, And then, as I've also mentioned, one of my favorite tracks, if not close to being my favorite track on the album next to Ghost Again, and um, Don't Say You Love Me, and that is People Are Good, which is a throwback to that era 
of of the of the early 80s of construction time again and some uh, and some great reward so thank you for the uh, for the email and that article was really interesting and especially that background on spirit i i would i would love to get a making of that album to get more into exactly what happened and i think it actually shows a bit in the musical direction of that record and why it sounds you know different and why it doesn't land on everybody on everybody's favorite um you know favorite list and i'm glad that james ford stuck around because the production on memento mori is absolutely fantastic all right let's get to some more uh, listener feedback uh michigan Migo maniacs says it sounds like they're paring things down visually question mark i only say that because the current live setup is slightly disappointing only one keyboard player seems sparse i would have hoped for a better fuller setup daryl bamonte maybe um i'll just it'll just uh look and sound too sparse i agree with you on the audience sing-along i want him to sing and we follow along um Side note, thankfully, he got rid of his little French waiter-esque mustache. Yeah, I don't necessarily agree of it, of it looking sparse. Um, I mean, obviously, there'll be an absence of, of, um, of Fletch up on stage. But, I mean, we're kind of getting closer to what we saw pre-Songs of Faith and Devotion before the drums came out. I mean, the, we've had the addition of, of Christian Eigner now for a while on stage, so we've gotten used to it. But the loss of an extra individual really just kind of takes us back to earlier Depeche Mode tours than uh, than before. So uh, I can't wait to see what the stage setup looks like. And like I said, I really do hope that um, I really do hope that uh, it is um, dynamic is probably the best word. All right. Uh, Dean writes one more sleep until we board the plane and head to San Francisco. Uh, my phone's YouTube music account has downloaded every bit of DM music I can find. I feel sorry for my wife, as despite her buying a copy of the singles collection back in the 80s, she hasn't really stayed up with the band's releases. Yeah, neither has my wife. Uh, she likes Ghosts again, but so far is not a fan of My Cosmos is Mine. I feel that. Uh, my wife as well. And uh, she hasn't listened to any of your 84 episodes. Uh, my wife hasn't either. <laughs> Uh, we have planned to visit a local San Francisco attractions for uh, this uh, for this weekend and have planned to go down and through Yosemite Park on our way to Sacramento. Hopefully by Monday, the roads and a park might be open by then. So looking forward to this event. It's going to be epic. We will be attending the opening night party at uh, Cilantro's uh, that has been organized by the Facebook uh, Depeche Mode Global Fan Group, Rob Rome. Yep, Rob's a good dude. Before the concert, hopefully we might get to hear some of the other Memento Mori, Memento Mori songs before we sit in darkness. Either way, game on. Uh, keep up the good work. Looking forward to the 101st episode. Yeah, I mean, I'm actually not that far away. I was shocked the other day when somebody mentioned that I'd reached 82 episodes. Friend of the show, Jay, writes, Love the story about passing the note that I told last week when I was in elementary school and told the cute girl let's play master and servant i was simply talking about listening to the song not actually taking part in anything that the song may describe being a depeche uh, being a depeche mode fan is fraught with danger when surfing the net and typing master and servant a question of lust strange love violator amongst others in a web browser although the film the background films are great on the last tour uh, they were having issues with the screens on the show uh, with the show that I went to and it was refreshing to watch enjoy the silence under the stage lights instead of a backdrop of chickens sheep and dogs and was far far more atmospheric I'm a Depeche Mode Star Wars I have some great third party anecdotes and F1 fan NASCAR is not really my thing in the UK but now the Jensen button has signed up and the Delta machine demos are still out there on a YouTube under different posts and better quality just uh type the song title uh just type the song title demo yeah uh, uh Jason I believe right um yeah I was able to find them actually I had several individuals that sent them to me I was really pleased to get those so thank you for uh, for that I've actually myself gotten into F1 I mentioned last week that the trifecta for me the three things that I love apart from my god and my family uh would be Depeche Mode Star Wars and NASCAR uh, but I've actually become a huge well not a huge I've become an F1 fan and I'm watching all of the uh, all the races now one of my favorite 
visuals. Well, a couple of my favorite visuals from the last few tours. Um, I'm with you. I didn't really care for the backdrop of chickens, sheep, and dogs either. I really liked, even though the song wasn't one of my favorites, um, should be higher on the Delta Machine tour. I really liked the the flame visuals on that one. And also on that tour, I loved on Enjoy the Silence, the female contortionists. I just thought that was so unique and different. And the way that they unraveled at the end of, uh, of the song. I would love to get the background on how they develop those visuals and time them out with the music i mean i suppose the band times out the songs for anton so that he has the exact time and how long they go for but i would love a documentary just on anton creating those visuals and timing them out the way that the way that he does i think that would be absolutely fascinating uh all right javier lopez a performance and art multimedia writes So, I've been uh, thinking about your dislike of the last album, and especially your feeling about the political nature of that album. I have two points to make first on My Cosmos is Mine. I don't think that you can see this as an apolitical song, speaking of war and the death of innocence. Then, Wagging Tongue feels very much like the band slapping back on the criticisms of that album. I don't have the lyrics in front of me, but there are some lines that seem specific to this issue. I don't know, but it seems like that. Um, I disagree on wagging tongue. Um, uh, but again, there's an ambiguity to it. I think you could probably layer, um, a, a thought like that on top of that song. Same thing with my cosmos is mine. Um, you know, Martin's mentioned in interviews dealing with COVID and the effect that it had on him. And I think in wagging tongue, the, another angels die. People have pointed that out. Um, seems to make some sense, but also my cosmos is mine uh, as well. And um, yeah, I mean, there's some outward facing of it. I like my cosmos is mine. Again, it feels like it's more of an instrumental to me, but it's a great opener uh, to the album. The political nature of spirit and the aspect of it I didn't care for. It really is just a personal thing for me. Um, I don't mind when the band gets political. I'm only going back to their construction time again era, you know, that was certainly very much um, a part of it. Can't escape it from songs like, you know, um, uh, Everything Counts, you know, even being as a huge a hit as it was. Uh, a lot of it just comes down to the fact of what I do full time as <laughs> as, a, as a radio radio talk show host and having to cover the news. Um, I prefer my Depeche Mode to be introspective, uh, you know, to look inward, not outward. And um, I get a plenty of politics on the daily that I'd rather have my Depeche Mode not focusing on that. And it's really just a couple of tracks. Poor Man was one that just didn't just didn't land uh, land with me. It just was too, the commentary was just too on the nose uh, for me. Not that I disagree with the commentary, it just was too on the nose and it wasn't necessarily something I enjoyed. From a musical standpoint, I thought it was all right, so... All right, uh, 88 Strange 88 writes, used to listen to you when you were on the radio back in the Inland Empire days, enjoying the podcast. Holy cow, you go way back. We're talking 97, 98. Yeah, 97, 98, 99. That's, yeah, that seems, well, it was going on 24 years ago, if I'm doing my math correctly, right? 30 years ago? No, 20? I don't know. I was told that math would not be a part of this podcast. Yeah, 24, 25 years ago. All right. Uh, James Rigby writes, on the chanting in my cosmos is mine, I actually liked it, especially when I realized how um, especially uh, how especially fear is sung on it was so similar to pimp um, as well. So I think that's the that's, that's the lyric. I hadn't really... I, yeah, I was confused by how you, uh, by by your wording there, but yes, I understand what you're saying, and and yeah, I can see the similarities uh, there. Uh, Modehead 101 writes with regards to the forthcoming live set. I'm hoping they will play a few of Fletch's personal favorite DM tunes that haven't been performed in years, such as the Sun and the Rainfall. Yeah, and I'm really hoping for that as well. And uh, I included that on my uh, on my set list as it was mentioned early on in the press uh, after the October news conference. Um, Sligmongji writes best track, best tracks on the album Mento Mori and why. All right. So from a personally, from a personal, right, this is all subjective. My own, uh, my own personal, uh, view, uh, ghosts again, 
uh, is probably it's probably my favorite track on the on the album, and it was chosen for a single as a single for a reason. Um, people are good because of just how much of a throwback it is. I love the nod to. Uh, and I can't imagine it wasn't intentional to I Feel You. You'll know what I'm talking about when you hear um, the song. And it just, it really just is classic Depeche Mode. The keyboard and synth work in that song is just incredible. Uh, and I mentioned this in my interview that I'm just, I'm shocked that that song even exists in 2023. Uh, it, it's it's amazing. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Don't Say You Love Me is fantastic. The strings um how cinematic and dramatic that song is um soul with me uh, i mentioned uh as well earlier is uh one of the best uh martin tracks in my opinion in uh, in decades and before we drown uh is a dave penn track and uh it's just absolutely solid i mean lyrically it reminds me not because the lyrics are the same but in the same vein of like broken uh, in the way that Dave writes, uh, but the music, uh, and again, the synth work on that track um, is, it's very dynamic in the way that it opens up. It actually kind of opens up one way, and then it shifts as Dave gets into the lyrics and kind of and kind of alternates back and forth, and it just works really, really well. So, Ghosts Again, Soul With Me, um, Don't Say You Love Me, uh, People Are Good. Um, before we drown, uh, those, those five tracks are just stellar. I mean, those are the ones that I'm hoping, and I don't think, hang on, let me pull up my playlist. I don't think I'm missing anything. I mean, the whole album is good. <laughs> I just I can't, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. My favorite stranger is growing on me big time. Um, speak to me. Yeah, I just. They could. I wish they would do the whole album live. I mean, that would really make me happy. <laughs> it's just, yeah. I'm. Um, I I would like to see them open with "Speak to Me." I think that would be really, really interesting. Kind of in a higher vein. I I would dig it if they did that. And then a trick. The the way that song trails off, um, into a cluster of noise and and feedback loops. Uh, would be a really interesting opening and then slam into people are good. Yeah, see, I'm just I'm getting excited. All right. Um, Sal, Salius uh, Bulotus. Salius Bulotus. You people are making it difficult me on your, difficult for me on your names. Please, um, yeah, feel free to pronounce your names for me if I'm getting these wrong. Um, My Little Universe demo sounds so good. If they played their cards right in the studio, it could have been a smash. Definitely a single track. Makes me slightly disappointed. Yeah, of all the Delta Machine demos, um, while I really love the album version, they took it in a completely different direction. And My Little Universe was actually sounding more like people are good in terms of the synth work than what ended up on that album. And then lastly, uh, Ben M. writes, and this made me laugh, the... Um, atmospheric my cosmos is mine is meant to be heard while you're high martin gore's vocals make sense in that context all right (laughs) i'll take your word for it all right expect another show or two or three before friday at least that's my intention time permitting if you want to email me, talkshownerd at gmail.com. As always, if you want to support my nerd world, head on over to uh, Amazon.com and search for John J-O-N Justice. Check out my science fiction space opera series. You like Depeche Mode. If you also like to read sci-fi, treat yourself or a family member with science fiction. If you like your science fiction epic with Depeche Mode references, both direct and indirect, romance and filled with action, Embark is perfect for you. Seven books in the series, written for adults, but great for ages 11 plus. The entire series is available in ebook, hardcover, paperback, and audiobook. Again, Amazon.com or MyNerdWorld.net. So, look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much for checking out this this uh, bonus episode. I'm going to go walk the dog and listen to Memento Mori. Talk to you again in a few days. Bye. Oh. And I hope wherever you are, you're happy, you are healthy, and you are safe. Can't forget that.